Hello everyone, um, it's great to get the invitation to join you today to tell you about some of my research, which is uh, how can we achieve a sustainable and healthy diet? So in this short lecture, what we're planning to do is for me to present for about 20 minutes and then we'll have 20 minutes remaining for some questions. Now I'm not able to see your chat throughout the presentation, uh, so what I'll do at the end is pick up your comments and questions then. So I'll just go ahead and tell you a little bit about what are sustainable diets, how can we achieve healthy diets and focusing on sort of a case study why we shouldn't ignore protein for healthy ageing. So this session is being recorded and it will be put up on the website uh, in due course. So if you want to listen again, then that would be great. So first of all, what are sustainable diets? Well, this really focuses in around the fact that the population is growing and it's thought that we're going to have about 9 million people on this planet by 2050. And we embrace a sort of Western style of eating, which means that we are very reliant on meat and animal products. And this means that the demand for animal based protein is expected to increase by 80% up to the year 2050. So this really uh, places a huge demand on the resources on our planet and the food chain has an impact on that. And that's through farming, through to transport, cooking and food waste. And this can contribute to environmental damage. Some of the estimates vary, that is hotly argued in academia, but the food system is thought to contribute to around 20 to 30 percent of the production of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, there are other impacts as well in terms of deforestation and water use. But I want to focus on greenhouse gas emissions and of course greenhouse gas emissions are linked to impact on climate change. So in this diagram here, I realise it's quite a busy diagram for you to look at, but really it embraces that this is a really complex system. And I like this diagram because it, it goes from farm to fork. So we can see the image of the cow there and cows uh, produce uh, methane through uh, their digestion system. And that methane can in turn impact on greenhouse gas and climate change. Of course, the food we eat also has an impact on health outcomes, whether it hits the non-communicable diseases. So we're going to focus on that. So really, um, it's a very complex system, but I will hopefully give you, be able to give you an overview of some of the important issues. So the definition of a sustainable diet are ones that are protective and respectful of biodiversity and ecosystems culturally acceptable, accessible, economically fair and affordable, nutritionally adequate, safe and healthy, while optimising natural and human resources. And I'm using there the reference from the UN General Assembly. So it's really nice there that the sustainable diets definition also mentions that it's nutritionally adequate. And we're going to look at that just in a few minutes. So in order for us to move away from this Western type diet that I mentioned, which is heavily uh, biased towards animal products, we really need to transition towards a plant based diet. So this concept of a sustainable diet really highlights the environmentally unsustainable nature of our current consumption patterns, particularly in affluent societies. So in theory, a sustainable diet could minimise environmental damage and also support a resilient in farming and food sector where people can eat a healthy and nutritionally balanced diet. So I think it's worthy to note that of course our, our meat intake, in particular red meat intake, was highlighted by the World Cancer Research Fund and the WHO, which is the World Health Organisation, that we should be limiting our red meat intake to less than 500 grams a week with emphasis on consuming less processed meat. And that's because it was linked to a meta-analysis linked to colorectal cancer. So what type of protein do we eat in the UK? So here um, I've put up a bar chart, which is uh, the National Diet and Nutrition Survey data, um, which asks consumers what type of foods that they're eating. 
And we can see that the main types of protein sources that we eat in the UK are of animal or origin. So at the top there is chicken and turkey, so poultry at 20%, beef at 15%, followed by baked beans, eggs, meat pies, oily fish, sausages, pork and white fish. And noted that's fried, that's kind of like our Friday fish and chip supper. So it's heavily reliant on animal based sources. Remember dairy we would count as that as well because the milk comes from cows. And it's notable that the only protein source that comes from plants is our uh, trustworthy baked beans. So this isn't really a sustainable approach going forward. So what could um, the sources look like? So I've put up a diagram here in the corner of the screen, which I'll elaborate on in a minute, which is emphasising again that our current sources are surrounding around dairy, meat, egg and fish, but we need to be moving to other sources that would include uh, grains, legumes, uh, different algae, insects and perhaps even lab grown meat that we call in vitro meat. So um, I've tried to highlight the different sources here where um, plant protein or non meat sources could include nuts and seeds, legumes, grains, non-dairy milk and supplements. So perhaps some of you already um, use non-dairy milk. So you know the oat milks, the almond milks are quite popular now, even in uh, coffee shops. And some of these grains that we call the ancient grains are also becoming quite trendy. So um, some of the ones that I'm certainly familiar with would include uh, quinoa, or uh, oats is obviously very popular in Scotland here, buckwheat and chai. Do any of you take supplements? I'd be interested to know about that, whether you take any of the spirulina sort of powdered supplements, which add a very vibrant green colour if you're adding them to your smoothies. But really it's not so much these sort of um, novel sources, it's moving to transitioning towards the inclusion of, let's say, legumes and other greens in our diet. So um, let's think about consumer acceptance, because um, what, how would you feel if um, we replaced your usual beef burger with a, a cricket burger? So would you have a face like this um, or would you be quite uh, willing to try out new sources? So this is a, a, some data presented from one of the EU projects called Protein to Food Project. And they highlight us that it's actually environmental concern is indeed the main motivator to reduce mean intake. Consumers were asked this question here, uh, asked for giving the reason why they reduced their uh, meat intake and the top was environmental concerns, uh, followed by animal well-being, I don't need it. And, and interestingly, health only came in as a potential answer for 22% of participants. So it's not always the sustainable diets that are recognised as being healthy diets. So trying to embrace some of the um, topical issues in this slide here, we know that co common consumers concern is trying to recognise what plant protein sources would be and whether as good quality as what would be achieved from animal sources. And we have what's called, what I call protein power. Protein is a macronutrient that I do a lot of work with, particularly with food companies, and it is sought after, but actually it has a huge amount of confusion amongst consumers, because of course we don't eat protein per se, do we? We eat food and we eat nutrients. So in general, consumers do have the ability to describe the role of protein diet, they understand it as a building material for muscle health and perhaps a weight loss tool due to its appetite suppressing properties. And my own reflection is that I can see more plant based selections coming in to supermarkets into retail. For example, I pulled out here the image of the Marks and Spencer's hidden veggies and the plant protein range as embracing what I call a flexitarian diet approach. So achieving a sustainable and healthy diet means that it's unlikely that we're all going to turn vegan or indeed vegetarian. Maybe it'd be more likely that we turn flexitarian, where you sort of opt in and out of meat free options uh, on occasion, such as meat free Monday. So um, perhaps you look out for alternative uh, vegetarian products when you're going shopping. 
So on this image here, there are plenty of reports that can guide governments and non-government organisations to help us achieve that. And also we have different um, ways of looking at information from a public health point of view. So I've put in the, the Chinese and Japanese um, pagoda and spinning pot as examples, and we'll come back to the UK uh, version. So there are guidelines that support a more sustainable dietary pattern to reduce intake of meat. So in the UK, we have what's called the Eat Well Guide, which is a representation of the different food groups that we should be consuming in order to achieve a healthy diet. And in the UK, the reference nutrient intake, as we call it, that's the amount that is thought to uh, support most consumers, is around about 0.7 grams per kilogram body weight. So you need to be able to calculate that out. And I'm going to show an example for you in the next slide. But of course, this is just guidance because the amount of each nutrient differs between individuals and at different life stages. And we'll pick up on that. So here we have a 75 kilogram man and a 60 kilogram woman. So how much protein would they need? So we can see here for the 75 gram man multiplied by 0.75, he would need 56 grams in a day and the 60 kilogram woman would need 45 grams in a day. So here I've presented what the actual recommended intake is in blue and what we know from our national diet survey data is the actual intake. So we can see that the red bars are higher than the blue bars. So actually both men and women on in general uh, from this data source in the UK are actually consuming uh, over and above our protein intake. So there doesn't seem to be any issue there. It'd be interesting if, if we move to a more plant-based diet, if that was maintained. So achieving a sustainable and healthy diet, we need to consider that we have an aging population and we need to develop different dietary approaches to promote health and independence. And I consider that uh, health, health and wellness is a huge challenge for the food sector that hasn't really been currently tapped into. Protein is really important because it maintains muscle mass and strength as people age, something called sarcopenia. So we don't can't think about that, uh, that that is something that happens really towards the latter years. Actually, even when we're aged 30 to 40, we can see a gradual decrease in muscle mass. And over the age of 40, we can see a 30 to 50 percent decrease in muscle mass as we approach up to the 80th year. So the protein recommendations are not necessarily for adults considering the whole life course and not optimised for physical activity level. The physiological changes associated with ageing would tend to support higher recommendations for protein. So let's have a look again at what they might be. So here we've got uh, somebody over 65 years, we've got a gentleman on the left 75 kilos and a lady on the right 60 kilos. So that higher recommendation is 1.2 grams per kilogram of body weight. So therefore the recommendation for somebody over 65 at this higher level would be 90 grams and the lady would need 72 grams. So to put that in perspective, we've got a different uh, picture here. So the red bars are actually lower than the blue bars. So we can see that in particular in this age group, the amount consumed is actually less than the recommended intake. And that is a problem given that we know that protein is really important to support muscle mass. So that's a huge challenge in trying to optimise dietary protein intake in older people. So ageing well is an important public health message because there are now more people in the UK aged over 60 years than under 18 and a half. And we recognise that protein is really important to maintain that independence by preventing muscle mo loss and strength, which is called sarcopenia. Oh, so I want, and there are perhaps some students going to be joining the call today. So I wanted to add some reflections about the importance of research and highlight that actually research can definitely make an impact to highlight that sharing research findings is incredibly important and sharing your uh, research with different uh, public engagement and stakeholders impo is important. 
And certainly I achieved that way back in 2010 when I designed a new high protein moderate carb range, which is still currently one of the top selling health food ranges for Marks and Spencers and it's called Balance for You. So it's still available in Marks and Spencers. And uh, this was done uh, in collaboration with Marks and Spencer. So this is really a, a fantastic example of how we can transfer knowledge from science base to the supermarket shelf. And I've done it for uh, this was a, a range developed for for weight control. And I think that the next challenge will be how we can then implement uh, some of the scientific knowledge that's building to supporting making uh, different foods that are available to support this healthy ageing agenda. So final food for thought here is that really what I wanted to emphasise for you is that what, what we eat, how much we eat and how often we eat it can not only impact on our own lives but can influence the health of the planet. And that's why sustainable and healthy dietary approaches are so important. And of course, we are all experts in food. We all do it probably every day. And we should consider that eating, eating every eating episode is a chance for or to positively influence our health through our nutrition. So and then a final um, couple of points. I just want to Thank you to all my funders, volunteer and colleagues. It's certainly, you know, I get the chance to present these nice uh, research findings, but that's very much a team effort. Um, also, that if you're particularly interested, we do run lots of uh, online courses. In particular, I'm just highlighting one of the free ones that we run through Future Learn that will be running again in January, uh, which is looking at health and wellbeing. So yeah, scoop, scoop me an email if you want to keep in touch or send me a message on Twitter because it's really nice just to, you know, from our work at home, it's nice to engage with you through this online tools. Um, yes, happy to share any of my publications uh, if that's something that you're looking for.